All right. So our go hmm, I guess it just needed to be refreshed. All right. So our goal today, we're going to think about the purposes of the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to examine it again in Jesus's tradition. So again, we're going to look at this as a Jew teaching Jews, because like we talked about last week, that context matters so much in terms of when we're reading scripture. And we'll also think, or we need to think about how each part of this prayer connects to the individual and the communal experience. So I'm just gonna open with prayer. And in full disclosure, I am reading AJ's prayers because she writes them in relation to each um, lesson. So I'll just read AJ's prayer. So please join me. Holy God, Jesus taught us to pray to you with openness, expectation, and love. As we study this example that he gave us, may we grow in faithfulness to you led by your spirit always to trust your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. So, and as I said, we're going to move quickly. So I would like somebody to tell me what their earliest memory of prayer is, of prayer, not the Lord's prayer, but of just prayer. Just one person. The child's prayer, now I lay me down to mm -hmm. sleep. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Lots of nods. Okay, great. Okay. Does anybody remember when or how you first learned the Lord's Prayer? Sunday school. Sunday school? Did anybody just absorb it by standing in, in church with their parents for ages? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't go to Sunday school. So I must have just absorbed it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk about the five purposes. What I would like to do here is almost a little lectio. I'd like us, I'm going to read the five purposes. I'd like us to close our eyes while I read them. I'm going to read them super slowly. And I just want you to think about as I read them, which one or two is the most important purpose of prayer for you personally? All right. So prayer allows us to express our honest feelings to God. Prayer nurtures a connection with God. The more we pray, the better our connection with God. Prayer is a way to unite ourselves to our past and our communities. Prayer reminds us that we are not all the same, that we come from different places with different needs. And prayer is helpful for discernment. So I just, I just want everybody to enter into this discussion just thinking about um, which of those is most applicable to you. And again, those were in the handout. So you can go back and look at those there if you want to. All right, what I discovered was this video Amy stays, AJ stays really on track. This is, she doesn't go off so much in different directions. So she, I decided there was no use in me just repeating what, Amy, what AJ was saying and then having you listen to it. So I'm going to go back and forth with AJ and let her uh, um, introduce, introduce each section and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So bear with me. We all know my computer's on its last leg. We're keeping our fingers crossed that I'm going to share this and you're going to get it and not go away. <laughs> okay. So everybody hang with me here. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Okay, I've got it. Let's try it. Ready? Here we go. Everybody's optimized. Share. Can everybody see it? Yep. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can hear it. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls his disciples to him, which means that when we listen to the Sermon on the Mount, we as the audience, we are part of that discipleship group. And when he instructs them to pray, our Father, that's part of that group as well. He doesn't say, pray, my Father. He says, pray, our Father, as if he is setting up this prayer as part of a group effort 
one can pray the Our Father by oneself. There's nothing wrong with that. But the idea here is to recognize as soon as those words, Our Father, come out of our mouths, that we are already part of a broader community. Jesus is setting this up so that when you say Our Father, you recognize yourself as among the disciples. And in that sense, it's a beautiful public prayer as well as private prayer. It's possible that Jesus taught the Our Father in a variety of different ways. It's possible, and I think even more likely, that his disciples remembered it differently. The disciples are not some sort of ancient sages who remember everything as soon as someone spoke a word. They remember individually. Matthew has a version that seems more community-oriented. It's a little bit more formal. Matthew has Our Father, the one who was in heaven. Luke simply has Father. Both are entirely appropriate, but Matthew seems to work better, at least when we're talking about a more formalized public type of prayer. The hour. <laughs> okay. Everybody saw, everybody heard, we're good. Oh, whew, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So I would actually like someone to read a couple of different versions of the prayer. It was in the handout. Does anybody have the third page of the handout? If not, I have it on, sh on square, on share, I can do that. Does anybody have it? I can put it up anyway. Let's I see. have it, yeah. Okay, great. So it, it will have, um, hold on one second, let me see if I can do it. Let me just, yeah, we might be able to do it. Ready, here we go. Can we see that? Yeah. Okay, yes. great. So can I have like three people read? One person read the first column, then someone will read Luke, then someone will read the Didache. Can that, can that be done? Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody? I'll read one. Thank you. Um, should I start? Oh, sure, absolutely. Just read the Matthew. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Thank you. So will someone read Luke noticing that there's a giant gap? I'll read it. Father, hallowed be your name. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. Thank you. And would someone read the Didache and recognize that this is just one scholar's translation of the Didache? I'll do it. Thanks. Nick. Our Father who is in heaven, your name shall be made holy, your kingdom shall come. You will shall come to be as in heaven and upon earth. You shall give us our bread for our need today. And you shall forgive us our debt as also we are forgiving our debtors. May you not bring us into trial, but you shall rescue us from the wicked one. Since it is your might and glory into the ages, you shall prayer three times of the day in this manner. Thank you. And Karen, would you read our super special one? Yeah. This is out of the children's deep blue Bible story book. God in heaven, your name is holy. Let what happens in your kingdom happen on earth. Give us everything we need. Forgive us. Help us forgive others. Help us to make good choices instead of bad ones. Love that part. And that comes in later. So try to remember that help us make good choices instead of bad ones. And AJ's point here is, you know, there are so many different versions. And a lot of it has to do with how the Greek and the Hebrew were translated. But it's not the version that matters. It's the intent when we're praying. So we need to remember that. I'm going to let Amy talk to us about that first line now, Our Father who art in heaven. And for those of you who didn't have the book, it's really fun because Amy, AJ had her own um, way of looking at this prayer and she did at one point think that God might be art and then was confused by him being Harold. 
so she had some issues with the naming of God. But let's go. We will share her next portion. God was herald in heaven after having been art in heaven. <laughs> Our Father is a Jewish prayer, as the expression goes, nine ways to Sunday. Jews typically call God Father. Um, indeed, the prayer for the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel today, begins, Avinu Sheba Shemayim, which is Hebrew for our Father, the one who is in the heavens. We call God Father. We ask for God's help. We demand God's help. And we thank God for being who God is. I like the idea of praying to God as Father because I have a very, very positive image of my own Father as caring, as protecting, as interesting, as educating me, as just a lovable, lovable person. But I know some people have not had that positive experience with parents. Sometimes they pray our mother because it was their mother who was the provider and the caregiver. I don't think that's a problem. Others pray Oh, big brother, others pray to mother, father, God. I think the idea is to recognize the relationality as it should be. At the time of Jesus, people would have recognized the father as the caregiver. But more than that, at the time of Jesus, the Roman emperors sometimes arrogated to themselves the name father. Caesar Augustus called himself God, son of God, savior, but also father as we would think of George Washington as, say, the father of the country. So that when first century Jews prayed to God as father, they were actually making a political statement. Our father is the one who created the heaven and the earth. Our father is the one who is in heaven and in our hearts. Our father is not the one sitting on the throne of the empire. To pray our father is not only to make a personal statement, it's also to make a political statement. All right. So Amy talks about, I'm just, I'm just going to try and summarize all these things and we'll ask some questions. Amy talks about this concept of father being both personal and political. And one of the things she says is that it's, it can be a very positive thing. Our father it evokes lots of positive images, but she also says that for a lot of people that may not be the case. And so I'd like to ask, what, what are some of the positive images that you all have when you hear or when you think of Our Father or when you pray Our Father? And also, do we have some suggestions and ideas about what those who cannot use that term might use? Anybody? Um, I'm, I'm remembering that there's a book called The Inclusive Bible, and I'm wondering what it, how it refers to um, the Father in the inclusive Bible, which I don't have, but I want to get. I have a copy of that, but it's in my office. So I can look for that next time I'm in, able to get into my office. You post those. Anybody? Positive images when you think of Our Father or suggestions for those who don't have positive images? Well, I was lucky enough to have positive images, you know, of loving and caring and present and um, supportive. Mm. But my dad died when I was 16, so I didn't get the, the privilege of continuing to learn adult to adult, mm. which would have been a neat thing too. But I, I, you know, I, the memories that you have, things like teaching you how to drive. I have some very specific memories of amazing amounts of patience and trust when I hadn't earned either one of those. Oh, that's interesting, Judy, that you had those experiences when you hadn't earned either one of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very much how we think of God's saving grace, isn't it? We don't earn it, but we get that love anyway. Ooh, yeah. that was really good, Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, AJ claims that God as Father has ethical implications as well, a relationality that she talks about. Um, do you have thoughts about what these what these ethical implications of God as Father might be? Are there thoughts on that? Um, thinking of Father as you know, husband, a, a king. Do we have do we have thoughts on the ethical implication of of those words? 
Um, I, can you be a little more specific? I think I need a little help here. So, so if we're talking about God in relationship, if God is in relationship, are there ethical implications for our for our relationships with others? If we're going to talk about God as Father, which implies relationship, are there ethical implications for how we relate to our families, to our to our um, churches, etc.? How are we in relationship with each other? Well, I guess one could be justice. Um, I think the loving and the caring and the mm -hmm. open arms, you know, that is like probably the first thing I think of uh, mm -hmm. that we need to have those open arms to, toward each other and towards the uh, love our family and our friends, but then to the whole world. I mean, this is, you know, the whole, the whole idea of being approachable and being willing to be in relationship. That's a big deal. I think yeah. it kind of puts us all in recognition of, of the father and all being children. Mm -hmm. And Jane, you're using that word all. You know, AJ talks about giving loyalty over to this new, much larger, inclusive family. And when I'm saying this, I know you didn't hear it in the video, but a lot of this is in the book. You know, she talks about being part of this new family where God is the father, this all encompassing situation. Um, thank you. And, and politically, um, you know, Amy talks about, or AJ, sorry, I keep calling her Amy, talks about, um, it was a political statement. At the time, it was a political statement because Caesar claimed to be father of the fatherland. So does our claiming God as father have changed our relationship to earthly authorities? in the way that Christ was claiming, you know, claiming father meant he was saying, God is our father, Caesar is not our father. Does our praying this prayer and claiming God in this way change our relationship to earthly political authorities? And how do we react if those relationships are in conflict? That really fits with Don, Don's sermon this morning from Joshua, uh, choose this day whom you will serve mm -hmm. as for me. Um, so it's a matter of choice of who are we really serving? Uh, it's not an earthly servant we're serving, but the heavenly father or mother. And it was, it was a good link to the sermon this morning, I thought. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, great. Yeah, I pick up the word subservient. Cool, yeah. And it is a choice, Bob. I like you're, you're talking about it. it's a choice. It's I had this conversation with some students in class the other day. It's a choice. And, and if we pretend it isn't, then we take the responsibility from ourselves. It is a choice how we're going to relate. Great. Well, I would go back to that part of the Bible that says, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. But, but we also believe that God comes first. So God's the higher authority. But we do have to deal with civil authority because we live in a real civil world <laughs> right right so we have to choose how we're going to deal with either and that react to both right okay we're going to move on i'm sorry does anybody else have anything they feel they need to say at that point point? and this is you know we just have to think about remember we're, we're thinking about how jesus meant these words when he spoke them to his disciples yeah, so to, that's a, a comment yeah um i really like the concept of relational father I remember one time years ago in a presbytery meeting, a, a candidate for ministry in referencing the mm -hmm. Trinity referred to uh, creator, uh, sustainer, redeemer, instead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And a um, pastor who was a, a woman really pressed this candidate for using those terms. She said, those are functions, creator function. Uh, redeemer function, uh, sustainer function. And we're talking in prayers in our Trinitarian language about relationships. I mean, you can use father or mother, but it's relational. And I, re I re remember that clearly of how she pressed that candidate uh, in, in an effort to be inclusive, you're missing out on the relationship. 
So Bob, do you, uh, this is a, you know, this is always a loaded question. You never know who thinks what about whom. Do you read much of Richard Rohr? Uh, a good bit. Okay. So, you know, he has in the last year or so gotten into this idea of the relationship between the Trinity. It's the lines between the three that matter. It's the whole relationship. It's become very relational in the way, and he's, he's able to explain it in a very accessible manner. So, right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Uh, good point. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I, I think I posted this week a thing from him and I, uh, if you saw my Facebook post, I don't know who's on there with me, but it was all, he was stating exactly that, that it is all about that relationship is what binds us. And the thing I was thinking before what you were saying too, is that, you know, uh, you know, Caesar may have proclaimed himself the king, meaning that he's over and above everybody. But the reality is we're all, all God's children on the same plane. So he having this, uh, Caesar having this authority, bleh, who, you know, no, <laughs> then work for me. You know, God is the authority. He's the one we're all on the same page, regardless of what we do and our station in life. And that's what we're, I mean, I believe that very much. Oh, well. <laughs> well you know, that, I, I, um, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I feel that, you know, that family, that uh, global family, and as children of God, children are unformed. We need guidance. Um, you know, we need protection, deliver us from evil. We need growth. We need um, transformation, and I, you know, I think the civil part of it is we're not always on the same page at the same time. But as a uh, society, we, we need to make a commitment to move forward with God uh, to into the civil world. So, in relationship with God, so we can in relationship, in relationship with God, with the other right, right. Thank you all. Thank you. And to carry that one step further, I know you want to move on. No, no, go ahead. Think of how think of how Jesus came into this world. He came in. He was, you know, born in the quote stable and put in a manger. They all were expecting this <laughs> child, this king, to be born with all this pomp and circumstance, in great, you know, with all this regal regal stuff. And it didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. And isn't that another piece that shows us again the humbleness? of and the station of all of us regardless of how you know we th we can proclaim that we're the king but the reality is you know we're all in the same plane again yeah and we've been doing this forever you know and, and i hate to I'm, I'm obviously going to show the fact that I'm a student right now, but you know, between Henry and Elizabeth, they were using these different words to indicate whether or not they were actually governor of the church, supreme ruler, replacing God, speaking for God. This has been going on forever. This idea of trying to usurp, you know, where power over over both the church and state. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I, I have a little bit of a question, Pat. Um, I don't know. I can answer anything. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, you raised the question, so uh -oh. I want to make sure I, I'm getting where you're going with this. You're talking about the prayers being community oriented, and you're talking about the fact that it has an ethical purpose. Um, I think when you start talking about ethics and you go to the Our Father, there's really things coming through here, which is like equality forgiveness, um, as I said before, justice. I mean, it's all in this prayer, you know, forgiving our debtors, um, treating each of us as equals, um, the kingdom to come that mirrors heaven. I mean, these are really, I think, very deep thoughts because basically what you're getting out of here is is almost like the code of the way you should live your life. That's going to become clear as we go. That's exactly right. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fair, it's, a diff, it's a very different take that we're not used to seeing. But in fact, it's obviously true, right? We can obviously relate to it almost immediately, right? Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for that. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share the next portion. Thank you. Where'd I go? Oh, 
hallowed be your name. Jews have been hallowing the divine name since Moses had a chat with the burning bush. The burning bush says to Moses, go to Pharaoh, go to the king of Egypt and say, let my people go. Moses doesn't want the job. Most prophets don't want the job of being a prophet. It's just too hard. And in the process of the conversation with God, Moses says to God, well, if I go to Pharaoh and say, let the people go, and if I go to my people and say, God is rescuing you now, which God are you? What's your name? God responds in Hebrew, Ehia Asher Ehia. I will be what I will be. God's name is an imperfect, irregular Hebrew verb. It comes into English as Yahweh, he will be. God's name is ineffable. God's name is hallowed. God's name is sanctified indeed. God's name is ineffable, unpronounceable. And Jews recognize that as well. So that when we see in our Torah scrolls and in our prayer books, those Hebrew letters that come into English as Y-H-W-H, that should be pronounced Yahweh, we pronounce them Adonai. That would be like seeing the letters F-R-E-D and pronouncing them Alexander. The name is that hallowed. As we go through the rest of the Our Father, everything resonates with what we know of Judaism at the time. Jesus does not have to be original at all times in order to be completely profound. Much of what he teaches echoes in the traditions of his own people. To hallow God's name means to recognize God's presence in the world. And at the same time, it means to recognize that we are not God. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things AJ asks here is, um, if God's name is hallowed, who is doing the hallowing who is doing the sanctifying is god making god's name holy are we able to make god's name holy and if so how is it that you know is god sorry who was that is god stepping up to make sure no one else makes God's name holy, no other authority takes takes precedent, or are we able to pray in such a word, or praise God in such a way that we hallow God's name? Is it both? What is this business about hallowing? Who does this? Kathy? I just feel like we can't make God's name holy. <laughs> I think he's, God is holy without us. I don't know. Does praying, praising, worshiping do anything or is it just a small part or it helps us recognize maybe mm -hmm. but i don't know that it changes god right. well you know when we talk about its relationship then it's got to be both ways i think i think he he is god but if we don't exist what is it i mean he's nothing so he needs us as much as we need him, I think. So I don't think God can really exist without us and vice versa. I'm not sure I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I didn't necessarily agree with what you said. So, so. Yeah, I don't really feel like God needs us at all. <laughs> but, but, but what does God mean if there's no nobody to worship him or, or to say he's hollow? I mean, what's he doing? God is in relationship with God's self. No, I think God's in relationship God with us. <laughs> That's the disagreement. Yeah. Well, did, doesn't it say in the scripture that if we don't praise him, the rocks will? Mm -hmm. mm. You know, uh, I, I, I think everything about everything in creation praises his name, but he created us to be in relationship to him and to praise him but i don't think there was i don't think there's a, a a need like we understand need i, I agree so you keep the raising heavens, your hand. Well, the heavens declare the glory of god yeah mm -hmm. i think, I think as, um, I, the I, lord's so I go think ahead. the lord's prayer deck is a declaration that um 
you know, we, we, Hallowed is my name is huge. And it's a declaration of what God is in relationship to us. He is the one and only. That's the way I, I interpret it. So if I, if I go back to the Baltimore Catechism, this, this is Catholicism. Why did God make us? God made us to serve, love him in this world. So the whole concept is that God was there by himself. He decided maybe he was lonely or whatever he decided and, and made us. And that gives us an obligation to kind of pay back. And we do that by knowing, loving, and serving him in this world. But why would he not make us if, unless there was a reason? I think he had a reason, which was, okay, I'm God, and I can do anything. But what does it mean if I don't have people who also express their love back to me? I mean, rocks can't express love back to God. Neither can the stars. It's men and women who really um, serve and love him. So I still go back to that idea. He can't do without us, and we can't do without him. So let me ask this. AJ says that in Exodus, God reveals his name to Moses as, I will be what I will be, which is open-ended, ineffable, possibly changing. There's a freedom to that. There's God is so expansive that we can't grasp that. In the Greek, Jesus says, I am. I am the bread of life, I am, which AJ describes as a much more um, structured. Um, there's a linguistic shift here, so it's much more permanent. Do you think, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a segue here, but do you, what do you think? How do you prefer to think of God? And this is, this is a different take on what we're just talking about. Do you prefer to look at God in this Hebrew translation of this ineffable, impermanent, changing, responsive way, or in this unchanging, I am this. Does this, does this affect how you think about this? So I can't tell if you have something to say there. You look like you might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, I like the first because I feel it's interactive. We are to be changing and bringing God's kingdom to earth. There's going to be so much change that's needed for um, mankind. And um, so that relationship, it to me, isn't static. Does anybody prefer the, and, and, you know, we're not necessarily saying this is what God meant. It's just the way it translates, you know, yeah. does anybody prefer that I am, I am in the box, I am this? Does anybody feel better with that? I just like that it's both and. There we go. And of course, once we think we understand God, we know nothing. So, <laughs> so we can have this conversation all day long. <laughs> okay. no, we are not going to figure out God. <laughs> no, 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 no. So actually the idea that um, this freedom of God's to be what God wants to be, et cetera, also means that God can be part of our conversation and listen to wherever it is we're coming from and be part of how we think. Can we... Um, how much do you think your prayers are part of a conversation, a changing, ongoing conversation with God? Can you tell when it's becoming one-sided? Can you tell when it's just you? Yeah. yeah. But you're aware that it could be a conversation. It could be going back and forth. Okay. Getting a lot of nods on this, yeah? It should be back and forth, but it's one-sided most of the time. Right. Well, as, as I've, over the years, as I've, prayed and studied and I in the last probably 20 years I've um, found myself in my prayer leaning more contemplative prayer of listening prayer of trying as best I can to empty myself and be open to God 
and not saying I'm, I'm showing up, God, I'm not sure what you want to do in me in this moment of prayer in this time, but I'm here trying to be quiet and listen. Um, so that, that was new for me because I always did the talking before, <laughs> which I still do that kind of prayer too, but I, I'm finding a value in that, just showing up and listening and being um, in the presence of God as, as a time of prayer. Because sometimes my I don't even know what to pray. There's so much in my heart and my, so just like, God, I'm just bringing me with all that's inside of me and your spirit knows what needs to come out of me more than I even know. And so. So a different, a different approach to the prayer. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, thank you. I, I have a thought, I'm sure <laughs> some of you will think this is heresy, but throw it out there anyway. I think when you're living and God's in the world, that God's in the process of actualizing himself, that God is changing as we change and the world changes, that it's a process of going from growth and change, and he's with us, and I think he has to grow and change too, and so I think the whole thing is the whole history of the world is God in the process of actualizing itself. So Nick, I, I, I don't think it's heresy. I think it's a whole nother conversation in class. <laughs> so is, are you okay if we, if we table that maybe till the end? Cause I, I get oh, 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 yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that you had thrown out the question about change and Right, no, but that so opens I just up so many doors. Yeah, yeah, and certainly go on. But I just no. wanted to say you could look at it that way too, that we're so in relationship with God that we change and he changes as well. And I, I actually love the concept and I'm right with you, but I, it opens up so many doors. Yeah, you know? go ahead. Yeah, yeah. cool, cool, I love it. Okay, um, AJ does not address the next line. She does not address thy kingdom come and thy will be done um, in the video. So um, she says that this concept of kingdom is very different than what we would be thinking because you need to realize that at the time they were living in occupied Judea. There's no democracy, there's an emperor, there's an army. And so this is a very serious political statement on Jesus's part at that time. Does this, realizing this, change what you think Jesus may be praying for and how it relates to what we say when we are praying these lines. And should we, in a democracy, it's not being maintained, let's not get into it by an army this very moment at this time, does this change how we should think about these lines? And because we all we all immediately go to, well, the kingdom come means that, you know, we want God's kingdom to be here, but but there's a very specific thing Jesus is praying for first. In a way, through democracy, we have um, the work to have the kingdom be here. I mean, it's it's to me, it's not so much to come, but is here, is coming, is is a, a you know a, like a project. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I hope that made sense. No, it does. It does absolutely. Um, AJ says that you know when we say the kingdom comes, we are meaning. We want the kingdom to be coming. And there are, in fact, people here working on that now, right? There are people living, entering into the kingdom as they reach to help other people, as they reach out to care for those. So, so that absolutely, she does, she just, yes, she absolutely feels that way. Um, she thinks that that's absolutely what is also meant. Um, it's, it, yeah. Anybody? Anybody? Thoughts on the kingdom besides unoccupied territory in Judea, more about how to make it happen, what our role in this is. I think it goes right back to Don's sermon again. No matter, you know, no matter who's who's in power, no matter which political party happens to be in power, that as kingdom people, that in following 
God's truth in seeking God's truth and following God's truth that we're planting a little bit more and more of the seeds of the kingdom that's going to be fulfilled eventually but that we can show bits of the kingdom now it's exactly what she says she says somehow we i sort of feel like when when jesus was praying at thy kingdom come thy will be done to me if i had been living in occupied judea at that time it's somehow saying again it's 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 almost reinforcing that no matter what your political situation is at the time god's kingdom can and is and will be coming so it's an assertion to me that this is this is happening now despite what the authorities think they can make happen oh i love that judy oh i love that yeah I think yeah. it also points out this idea of the kingdom and Jesus always talked about the kingdom being on earth and not some somewhere out there that we, I don't know, imagine it's out there where we don't know, but it's, it's, it is, it's much more present than, um, and involves earth, involves people. Versus some place we're waiting to get to, or some place right. that's another time. Yeah, it's yeah. the presence of God. It's his. It's his reign. That's what we're talking about. The reign of of God. The will of God. And I think we see examples of that kingdom uh, on earth in our daily lives in many ways, don't you? I mean, we see that, you know, in the soup kitchen, we see it on the, you know. Um, Pro, you know, some of the marches that have happened this summer, we see the kingdom, um, you know, when we're kind to each other, when, a when, you, when, you know, a child friends another child, we see that kingdom, we see that relationship. I mean, I have to believe that. I have to believe that the kingdom is around me all the time. It's not something like I'm trying to get to, I'm not trying to buy my way in. I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to have that kingdom here and now and uh, an understanding that it's not perfect because you know, I, there's more to it than this, than this plane, this, this earth we're on, but, you know, there's more to it, but I still feel that we have those examples all the time. I agree, Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that Jesus is continually saying that the kingdom of God is here now, but yet not here now. It's right. coming. It's the it's the, it's the now, but it's also the will be. So there's, and the whole Bible speaks of that. Um, so it's, it's not yet realized, but some of it's here. We're working towards it. It's happening in bits and pieces. It. And even Abraham was looking, it says in Hebrews 11, that Abraham looked forward to the city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God in, in Hebrews 11. So, you know, like it's, the whole, all God's people have always been looking forward to a time when God would reign, but right now we're bringing it in. It's not yet realized though. And this juxtaposes with the, um, thy will be done. And you know, what AJ says is we need to, because we need to seek out God's will in order to determine how to make the kingdom continue to manifest, right? And, and she says, and she says that Jesus says that we need to do that by, by reading and following and, and chewing on scripture together in community. She's very clear that she believes that this needs to be done in community as well as individually. Um, do, we, do we do that well enough in our church? Do we work together to, to, to determine God's will through scripture? Do we, is that happening for the purpose of determining the kingdom, of, of manifesting the kingdom? Are there better ways to do it? Andy, were you going to say something? No. So, well, I think, you know, just to that question, I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Sue was going to talk. So, sorry, Sue started to talk, Nick. Yeah, I, I, I believe that Westminster Presbyterian Church is amazing in the amount of ministries and work that is done within smaller groups and larger groups. Um, the world needs so much more, our community, our, our local community. And I think, um, I feel that 
the kingdom comes through, you know, work, acts, deeds, and certainly that's happening and so much more must continue to happen. And I struggle with um, uh, separating uh, uh, political um, decisions with uh, the church, but I, I don't have a problem um, separating actual community worldwide issues like cl uh, addressing climate change. You know, to me, that's a godly action. And um, so has our church, you know, entered into community? Absolutely. It's not, maybe it's never enough and with God's help, we'll, we'll keep moving. Um, I have a sense though of urgency about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I think. Right, right. Nick, were you gonna say something? Yeah, um, the answer to your, your last question, I, I think the way we try to remove evil from the world is through good deeds. And so if you look in our church and you look at Stephen ministry, you look at the deacons who volunteer for all kinds of different activities, um, extended communion to people in nursing homes who are shut in their regular homes. I mean, we're doing good deeds constantly in this church, whether we're helping prove the water in Honduras or whatever. I mean, it's the most active church I've ever seen or ever been involved with. And I think each of us in our own way chooses something to do to try to make the world a better place. But I think it goes beyond that. I think when we do these good deeds and we help each other, we're helping to remove evil from the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Roman Catholicism is very clear about some things. One is that there really is a devil in the world. There really is evil in the world. There really is a hell. And that the kingdom can't really come to on earth as it is in heaven. Um, unless enough of us do good deeds and remove evil. Yeah. Um, so I'm super mindful of the time and we have six minutes left and this is, I'm, I'm, I think the conversation is terrific. Um, sh should we continue and we'll see what we get through in the time and we'll see. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to go back to Amy now. She's going to talk, we'll talk to her again. Hold on. The expression commonly prayed, give us this day our daily bread, is redundant. It's like saying hot water heater. Give us our daily bread is fine. Give us this day our bread is fine. But give us this day our daily bread? Why the repetition? And the problem here is the Greek term epiousion, normally translated daily. We're actually not sure what it means because the first time it starts to show up in Greek literature is in this prayer. So one way of determining what a word means is to do retrojection. Jesus originally spoke Aramaic and probably some Hebrew. We get something that may sound like bread for tomorrow or bread for the future. And that makes an abundant amount of sense in early Judaism because one dominant way that Jews had of understanding the reign of God, the world to come, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven was a giant banquet. Bring about tomorrow's bread today may have been part of the original import of that prayer. Bring about that messianic banquet now. Bring about the kingdom of heaven now. And at the same time, the idea of daily bread or this day give us bread. Dear God, we know that not everyone has daily bread. We know that people are going to bed hungry. Please make it so that everyone goes to bed with a full belly rather than an empty one. And please, God, if I have the resources, make me the messenger so that I could provide that daily bread to others. And there's more. Daily bread reminds us of the manna in the wilderness that God provided. Daily bread reminds us that God does not actually give us bread. God gives us seed, but somebody has to plant it and grow it and harvest it and mill it and knead it and bake it. Dear God, thank you for all the people whose energies contributed to the bread. And dear God, if you were a member of the Christian community, 
You will remember in the Gospel of John that Jesus talks about himself as the bread from heaven. And dear God, thank you for that as well. It's a feast for the senses. Daily bread is something that you put into your mouth, but it's also a worldview if you can just but taste it. I go to church a lot. So I'm pretty sure that you guys are just saying, you guys are just all AJs. <laughs> I mean, I just heard AJ, AJ, AJ in these last conversations, which is pretty amazing. I, I, it's, it's, do you all hear it? Can you, we all are saying these things. Um, this, one, this one is so interesting to me. She talks about this, this redundancy and that actually the translation would be possibly better bread for tomorrow, bread for the future, meaning give us what we need today, give, give us what we need in the future today. She, um, I have several things I wanted to read, but I, I, I'm thinking we shouldn't take up the time. Um, this idea that we, she, she links our future with our past. God has given us these things. God has, God has manifested his gift to us, his bread to us, his through Jesus Christ. And we are asked to partake of and participate in this feast for today as a connection between these ancient prophecies and words with where we're headed. I, it's very, it's, I find it difficult to explain and I found it difficult to have her explain it. Um, does this prophecy about the messianic banquet that we are supposed to partake in. Um, change how you think about praying for daily bread. Does, it, does the idea that we are to, does, does that make sense? Does this idea of participating in this prophecy? Uh, Kathy, you're saying yes. So, so who has comments on this? Um, I just think that, yeah, praying, um, bring about tomorrow's bread today. It reminds me of God's kingdom coming mm -hmm. and so it's sort of another way of saying like bring it on you know like bring on god's kingdom and also reminding that we need what we need today to live <laughs> right right Necessities. she has this really cool thing she says about when they come to the synagogue for sabbath they end by serving food and they do it because the sabbath is a foretaste of the future of the world to come and her question is, do we celebrate communion as a celebration of God's future world? And I will admit, I've just not thought of it. And I don't know that we talk about it that way. Does anybody have a comment on that? I, I've not thought of it. She's very clear that that's what it is in Judaism. And I've, anybody, can, can we think about communion and participating in that as other than take, you know, as salvation so much as the future? Well, you know, again, I don't remember whether I I got this from, you know, one of the philosophers like Hegel or wherever, but the idea of communion for Catholics is that not only are you literally taking in the body and blood of Jesus, but you're becoming hopefully more like him. And if you're becoming more like him, you're going to help bring about the kingdom. You're going to help serve in the world you're going to become more of a servant um, all those good things that we like to talk about at Westminster but communion is for Catholics anyway the energy where they get their energy to go out and to be apostles and proselytes so it's definitely an idea about bringing about the kingdom all right that was a dog in response to a cat I think <laughs> That was really good, Nick. Anybody else? That was really. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on seeing communion that way? Well, in the great prayer of Thanksgiving, when we officiate at the table for communion, that's part of that prayer is that anticipating that day when we will celebrate with all your people and all of all times and places in your kingdom, you know, so that is incorporated into that great prayer of thanksgiving which is part of the liturgy for communion so listen for that you know next time we have communion in that prayer 
Yeah, I think Jenny, that's part of it. I think we don't, I don't, I don't know that all congregations know to listen to these things. They're all there. It's a question mm -hmm. of whether or not we know to listen to them or have been educated to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it is 101. Tell me, I warned you that this was very long. <laughs> um, what would everybody like to do? Do people want to try and finish this? Thumbs up, or do people want to have Jenny and I figure out how we can finish it later? Thoughts? Finish it, figure out how to do it later. Finish it. What what about just at least showing the rest of AJ? We could do that. Those that want to stay on. We could talk some more. Talk and those that need to go can go. Okay. Does that work? I'll finish AJ. And then those who want to stay, we can talk more. Okay. Can I just read this one little statement of from Richard Rohr? I yep. think it, it's pretty cool. Um, this is his quote, not me, certainly. We worship Jesus instead of following him on his same path. We made Jesus into a mere religion instead of a journey toward union with God and everything else. This shift made us into a religion of belonging and believing instead of a religion of transformation. And I think that's pretty way cool, especially when we're talking about communion. It's that transformation that we make when we take that in. Yeah. Betsy, can you type that up and send it to either Jenny or me and we'll send it out? Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. That's good. Yeah. Um, I'll share the screen and we can at least finish this and anybody, okay, here we go. A lot. In pretty much every church service, at some point, the congregation will pray the Our Father prayer or the Lord's prayer. And then I have to stop and think, wait a minute, which version are they going to pray? Is it going to be forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Or is this a church in which they pray, forgive us our debts? In Aramaic, Jesus' original language, there's a term chov or chova, and it can be translated sin, debt, or trespass. Because sin in Judaism has a, a thingness to it, it's something real. So people needed metaphors by which to understand it. Sin could be a stain that could be washed off, and hence phrases like washed in the blood of the lamb. Or sin could be a burden that is lifted off. Or sin could be a debt that needs to be repaid. But I think Matthew, indeed, I think Jesus was asking more than that. I think Jesus was also interested in economic reform. If I have and you need, and we are part of the same community, the part of the same family, why would I hold a debt against you? I could forgive you that debt, and I would know that if somebody had to borrow from you, you would pay it forward and forgive that debt as well, because that's how functional families work. Not to be taken advantage of, but to provide help when help is needed and someone else has the resources by which to provide. So when we hear forgive us our debts, yes, think about sin, but think about your pocketbook and your wallet as well. In Greek, there's a term perazzo, and it means to test, but it also means to tempt. So we're not talking here about testing as an exam, how much is, is two and two. It's not that type of test, but it's a test where somebody is checking to find out if you are being truly pious or if you're being simply hypocritical. If you're speaking the words, but you're not walking the walk. And we are being tested all the time. And we are often at the same time tempted not to do what we're supposed to do. We might think of the parable, sometimes called the parable of the Good Samaritan, better called the parable of the man who fell among the robbers. We could stop to help, that would be the right thing to do, but the priest and the Levite walk by, probably thinking to themselves, well, if I stop to help, something might happen to me, there are bandits on the road. The Samaritan is tempted to walk by, we all are, but the Samaritan passes the test and stops to help. Lead us not into temptation or do not bring us to the test. Do not let us use our own self-interest as a substitute for what we must do to love our neighbor as ourselves. Do not allow our privilege and our selfishness to get in the way of community responsibility. Don't let me take the easy way out, or as Jesus would put it, take the wide road and the wide gate. Dear God, do not bring me to the test. Don't put me in a position where I would do what's to my own benefit rather than what would benefit the community. But if you do, give me the strength 
to overcome that temptation. And I know simply from reading the Bible that you will give me that strength. Okay, does anybody need to go? Feel free to just pop off. No. I'm gonna go by. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Kat. Nice Thank you. Bye. I'm sorry it's gone so long. I have warned you. We have company. <laughs> right. Cool. We okay, saying everyone? All right. A few minutes. Okay, cool. All right. So forgive us our debts. Let's get to our debts. And she talks about this being both personal sin and economic justice, which of course we know. Um she says that she gives a metaphor. Sin is, is that we all have a, a heavenly bank account. And when we sin, we drain that account. And forgiveness is what restores the balance in that account between humanity and divinity, between humanity and humanity. Does that work for everybody? Does it sound like, does it, does it work that, that forgiveness is the key to this, to restoring the balance? What do we think about that? And, go ahead. Anybody? It seems that forgiveness is um, not, is of the heart and also of the deed. So let me ask you this. If we read Matthew 6, 14 through 15, it says, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your father will not forgive your sins. How do we react to the idea of God forgiving us only if we forgive others? What do we think about that? And how does that work with free grace and salvation? <laughs> Don't do it, Nick. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> um. You know, when I think about forgiveness, it, sometimes it's good to talk about actual events. So, you know, we, we read in one Bible study class about all those Amish children being killed in that school. Mm -hmm. And um, the pain of losing those children, as you know, is, is you can't even describe how painful it can be. And yet they as a community forgave the guy who shot the kids to the point that I think he was killed also after, but he killed himself. He killed, he killed himself, yeah. But the community forgave his family and, and they continued to dialogue with that family and even had him over for holidays. I mean, that kind of forgiveness is, is almost impossible to describe. And yet, I think when we forgive, we're being Christ-like. I mean, it's the power of that forgiveness that moves mountains. Uh, I also think back like to the Civil War and look what a bloody, terrible war it was. And yet at the end, when Lincoln could have had all those Confederate generals executed, what did he do? He looked at them and said, go home because he knew he needed to do that to bring the country back together. But the only way to get over that divisiveness and the horror of that war was to forgive. And the power of that forgiveness is still talked about. I mean, we've never done any other war where we didn't you know, judge other people like at Nuremberg with the Germans and the Japanese. But Lincoln set an amazing example, which was when it's over, just let them go home. Well, we there's that. Up. Yeah, and there's that famous quotation when the woman walked up and said, how could you not destroy your enemy? And he said, madam, by forgiving him, have I not destroyed him? Right. I've destroyed my enemy by forgiving him, right? Exactly. But the power that comes from that as an example to all of us is incalculable. Right, right. And so how does that relate to AJ's other point about economic justice? So if Jesus is not just worried about forgiving sins there, but also economic justice, if we can help, we need to help, et cetera. How, how does forgiving, does forgiving relate to our need to think about, respond to economic injustices? Are they related? Are they separate issues? Are there two separate issues here? This prayer is so complicated, who knew? 
Yeah, well, Jesus says it best. When you do it for the least of my brothers, you do it for me. I mean, and again, this church is a great example in all the ways that we go out and serve the community. We have committees about affordable housing. You know, all the work that we do in this church is exactly what we think Jesus told us to do, which is try to make things more equal, try to give to the poor, try to build the water system for people who don't have clean water. I mean, all those things are, are practicing our faith and we're doing the deeds that we give mouth service to. Others on this idea of our own. I, I have two comments. One in the first part of this is, one of my thoughts is that if, if we don't know how to forgive, I, I think it makes it very difficult for us to believe that God forgives because we, we get in, it's sort of like that idea of judgment, you know, judge not lest you be uh, judged. You know, if you have that mindset, I think it makes it very difficult to understand the grace of God. Um, and so therefore you become separated from God because you, 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 you can't understand that or accept that, um, that grace. In terms of the economics, one thing I'd heard, and I don't know if it's it's correct or not, but that the temple used to be a place where they they kept debts, they kept a record of debts. So I, I, I'm wondering if that ties in with this idea of sort of this economic um, equation and and this idea that we can't hold debts based, you know, on you know the the, the temple and and that it's, it's not a good thing to hold debt against somebody else. Um, so those are just two of my thoughts. Bob, I'm not touching it. Bob, can you respond please? <laughs> no. Oh, come on, <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> yeah, pick on the pastors. I am. Pastor? <laughs> that was a very oh, specific oh. historical question. <laughs> I'll try to see if I can find out where I okay. All right, right. find the answer. Come back to Are us. You asking about the temple, about the, is that what? Yeah. What is the relationship I, here? I I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and it's a very good point, Jane, and it would make sense again because because we have to continue to put Jesus in the context that he was responding, he was the speaking political. about what was going on as well as the bigger picture, right? So that, that would make perfect sense. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah that there's. Uh, that the day of atonement and sort of the line in the sand of moving forward after uh, repaying debts, or am I mixed up there? So debts, uh, there's somehow to move forward with a clean slate seems that not only would you repay debts, but have that forgiving of debts so that everyone's starting afresh. So I think there's something there about that. I, I'm, I don't know enough about it. And but that's Nick, also, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say the word atonement. You know, it's it's forgiving those debts and it's forgiving the pains that others have caused you. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, the Yom Kippur is about that. It's mm -hmm. about confessing your sins and asking for forgiveness, but also forgiving those who, you know, our words trespassed against you. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely part of it. Anybody else on this? Okay. Jubilee come into any of this. The forgiveness of year of Jubilee, every 50 years, the Jews would right. forgive all the debts of everybody, trying to keep everybody on, on a same level. No one's better than another so that the debts couldn't mount up. I'm not sure if it comes in with this or not, but that's an interesting point, though. Definitely, that's an interesting point. I, I think there's a couple things here. Okay, I, I get the forgiveness part, and I, you know, that's the problem. That's very difficult. Also, call, talking about holding people accountable for what what they've done, and that might that's a little bit different. Okay, not forgetting, because. You know, you talked about, Nick, you talk about the, the Amish with the nickel mine steel, you know, and I, I happen to live out this way. And so I have some strong feelings about Amish forgiveness because I witness what they do also. 
and they are not necessarily the most forgiving people in their relationships with people out, outside of themselves. I know the guy that was, you know, that did that was it was outside of themselves, but outside of their community, they're not necessarily that forgiving. And they're also, um, you know, they shun their own members. And oh, yeah. it, it's pretty, it's not, there's not a lot of mercy there. Um, and that is, that's difficult for me to reconcile some of that. Um, so, you know, as far as, yeah, I, you know, the forgiveness of, of forgiving that guy, yes, it was, you know, that was, of course, an incredible witness to people. Um, but by the same token, there's other conflicts that I see with what they do. And so that's, that's hard for me. And I mean, I've, my family's kind of been victims of that. Um, so I, I kind of, you know, I kind of have a little different opinion. Um, but there's also, you know, as far as like, you know, the civil war and the Nuremberg trials and all that, you know, you also had to hold this. It was a matter, it was also holding people accountable we were, you know, the civil war was a different scenario because it was brother against brother. We were on the, we were all in the same country, you know, we were all on the same side and that that's a little different too. So there's, it's a very complicated, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And it's like, it's, you know, it's a little bit more uh, difficult for me to just make one, one thought, you know, it's, there's kind of some different stuff. I don't know. You know, there's nuances and gray areas. You're absolutely right. If you, if you are interested, I mean, I think the probably best, Betsy, and you're bringing this up, the best um, example of of wrestling with the incredible complication of this is, is the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa. Right. What they did and the way they looked at, all, you know, victims, survivors, it's, it's so mind-blowing. And if you if just if you start to just poke around in the, in that area, it, it's, it's incredible what they were able to do in, in the light of such incredible atrocity, right? It, it's, it, yeah, it's just a mind blowing theological discussion about this. That's yeah. And it, it, because it addresses these things you're talking about, Betsy, obviously, you know, I mean, they, they considered everybody a victim, every survivor was a survivor and, and the whole theology behind it is fascinating. So I would just say that out to anybody that's interested in that kind of perspective on this and the, the way to forgive even the worst perpetrators and, and how they approached it. It's, I still don't get it. I mean, I've, I've studied it for a while and I still don't get it. And I think Betsy's point is extremely well taken. It's very complicated, there's many different layers. And that's why, you know, you get people who believe in capital punishment and people who don't. There are people who believe taking another life is God's territory, not our territory. So we shouldn't execute people. We should let God make those decisions. So it, it's always that balance of how much you serve Caesar and how much you serve God. And, and it, is it God really telling you to forgive or something else? Well, so, it comes back to choice, right? It comes back it to choice. Back it's to our choice. choice of how we're going to deal with this, right? On an individual and a corporate level. It is our responsibility, right? All right. Um, lead us not into temptation. Um, I would just, I will shorten some of the things she says here, but, you know, none of us wants to talk about God possibly tempting us. And she, um, she suggests we read James, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil and does not tempt anyone. And yet, all we have to do is look at Genesis and Abraham to know that's not necessarily the case. Or Jesus in the desert. Exactly. Right, 40 exactly. days and he's tempted by the devil. Right. Promised the kingdoms of the world and all kinds of things. Right. Major temptations. Right. And AJ's point is, it, it's true. God does tempt us. First of all, what do we think about that? But also, as you heard her um, formulating a prayer, God provides us with the resources to um, to ward off those temptations, to deal with those temptations, if we so choose to ask for and use them. So how do you feel about God testing us? And do you think that God provides us the resources to, to deal with those temptations and to ward them off? Do we think that? I Which think I will say leads us into the discussion about evil. Does evil exist? Is evil operating on its own? I think he does tempt us, but, but it's for a bigger reason, which is to make us stronger, 
to make us get more in sync with him. Um, you know, he goes back to Adam and Eve. He tells them, just don't eat this apple, you know, and they do. <laughs> um, so he gave us free will and we're going to make mistakes and he's going to tempt us, I believe, at times. It may be something you wouldn't think is a temptation, but the death, let's say, of a young child that you're very close to. I mean, do you get bitter over that? Are you able to go on? Do you make that the controlling thing of your life, that bitterness? But I think in each of those cases, we become stronger if we can overcome it. And we get closer to God every time we do it. And you're right, Nick, some of those things that don't look like temptations, that just looks like a horrible offer, suffering, disaster, right? It really could be a temptation. It could be seen as being tempted to go in the wrong direction, react the wrong way, and make it your life's mission, right? Okay, there was a reference to James, and in chapter 1, verse 13, no one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and God himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by, um, by it. Mm. What translation of the Bible are you using, Bob? I can't hear you. Oh, Bob, you mean the, the original mean? languages I'm reading from okay. Aramaic. Okay. That's not true. That's a lie. <laughs> not true. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was believing it. New the new RSV and RSV. Okay. That's 13 through 14. Right. Yeah, I my feeling is I don't feel God tempts me or tempts us as much as we're praying that God will lead us from the things that do tempt us, the things that are the trials, the things that are weaknesses that can lead us into sin. Um so way I in, in praying that lead me not not into temptation not that i believe god leads me into but lead me away from temptation right yeah so, i would agree with, with jenny i i don't think even nick you said something about you know jesus being tempted i'm not sure that was god tempting jesus um i think it was the temptation of, of worldly power that he faced and i think those are the temptations that we face be they small worldly powers or large worldly powers I also wonder how much some of this is, it ties into the beginning of this prayer where we're talking about your kingdom come and how does forgiveness of debt relate to your kingdom come and the, the presence of the kingdom? Not this transactional relationship between God and us that, you know, okay, if I forgive, then God will forgive me. I mean, that's sort of this transactional thought about what God's about, which I don't believe. Um, but it, but I wonder how, if it's more tied into what is this idea of what the kingdom is about? What is God saying, um, or Jesus is saying about what does the kingdom look like? Uh, to me, that's so much of his message of trying to show us what the kingdom might look like um, in words, you know, that, that fall short, but that's all we have. Um, so that's how I part of how I'm looking at this. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. I think it does, Jane. I think it ties, you know, when we finish and we don't all versions finish with that king, the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, that kingdom ties back again to the beginning and the kingdom coming. And I think, I think that's it. I think it wraps up with the kingdom and what we're supposed to do to make it happen and how all these things relate to it. So you were going to say something, weren't you? Did I see you out of the corner of my eye too? Oh, yeah. Um, I, from, for decades, I did not believe there was truly a devil or evil in a way I could understand. And, uh, now I do. Um, and there's a, there needs to be a conscious effort for me, us, you know, humans, um, you know, lead us not here. I know, I know the temptations there but deliver me from, from that. And by turning to you and away from the dark or whatever it is that's going on, um, that's, that's our free will and our choices to, to choose God. 
There are references to Richard Rohr. He has a book out, came out this year. It's 100 pages, it's short. Whatever Became of Evil. Mm. It's a great little book. It's, uh, I think, four chapters, easy to read. Well, I won't say easy to read, but very thoughtful as he is. Whatever. It's also, it's also a book. Um, it was what? Oh, Whatever Became a Sin by a Jewish. Yeah, similar kind of thought. And I think he was Jewish. Is he Jewish? Who? The, the guy who wrote Whatever Happened to Sin. Oh. Oh, which is Carl Menninger of the Menninger Foundation. He was a Presbyterian elder. Presbyterian? Okay. How's that? That's good. <laughs> It's good. I'm glad you knew. Oh, I'm a Jewish guy, though. <laughs> um, so there's lots more. Do we? Does anybody have anything else they feel they need to say? We can. We will wrap this up. That more, more thoughts, more things we need to discuss right now. There's lots more to go. Obviously, if not, I will read. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy, and I would issue a challenge. AJ issues a challenge, and I would issue a challenge that we would attempt to pray this prayer by ourselves every day and think about it in these terms and go a little deeper than just reciting it and see what happens. And frankly, maybe keep a journal, see what happens, see how it might change your perspective on self, on the world, on how you relate to church or things going on. Just a challenge for a week or a month, just recite it every day and see what happens perhaps. Yeah. Before you, do, Warren Reed, who I think many of you know, he passed away in the, I've, Beginning of this year, I believe, I officiated his um, memorial service at Maris Grove, I think right at the beginning of the coronavirus coming upon us. But my last visit with him before he died is that he wanted us at his funeral to pray the Lord's Prayer like we really mean it. And I, and so at the service, I said, I told everybody that I said, let's pray it slowly, like we really mean. And it, it was such a it was such a nice way to introduce it. So I, I like as you're saying for us to read it and pray it. This week I would on, on top I'd give Warren's invitation to pray it like you really mean it. Those lines, those words. And why don't we close with that? Can we do it together? Is everybody, are we good for that? I would can say we, mute us because it's going to sound, unless you want. That's true. We'll just mute ourselves and say it. His tongues. <laughs> It'll come off. All right. Do you want to mute? Or do you want me to stay on and lead or should we mute everybody? I'll lead. Everybody mute. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for hanging in forever and ever. <laughs> And this is truly, I, I don't know that another one's going to happen. This one appears to be so short and is so long. <laughs> so thank you all very much.